Let's keep it there. Yep. Date, date, and time. It's totally, yeah, yeah. It's on its way. It's on its way. Here we go. It's getting crazy. Yeah. Jerry, how you doing? Same. Oh. Yeah. Howdy. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Everybody else ready? Ready? Okay. Time is 7.02, Wednesday, April 13th. Town of Wiggins work session is hereby in session. We're getting uh, feedback. <laughs> There's a slight delay. <laughs> okay, time is. <laughs> That's why you get to edit yeah, it. Yeah, there we go. Stop. Hear what it sounds like. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> that okay? Take two. Yeah, that's much better. Yeah, let's <laughs> try that again. <laughs> okay, first item is discussion on the acquisition of body cams. I think that's you, Chief. Turn it on, turn it on. I didn't want to wear out the batteries. It's on. But Mark, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay, perfect. <laughs> So obviously, um, with the materials in front of you, the uh, with the Senate Bill 217, we are required to go to body cameras by July of 2023. And so we've been testing some body camera systems uh, and we uh, did a number of different tests in the field and we looked at all uh, other systems that we haven't had a chance to test, but that other departments have tested and are actually using and so we would like to you to go to the body worn um, camera system by utility. That's the that's the brand. And as part of that, we applied for a grant to uh, purchase these purchase the system. And we did receive a twenty eight thousand nine hundred ninety five dollar grant to purchase the system. The original system was priced at over eighty thousand dollars and then they reduced uh, they got some discounts. We got it down to sixty thousand, and so the basically paid for half of it uh, with the grant. Um, based on our test of the systems, the patrolized by stunt cams is a very basic system. Uh, didn't have all of the functionality that we felt like we needed um, to be successful. One of the biggest functionality issues is the redacting software. So if somebody requests um, footage of, of an incident and there's other people involved that weren't part of the incident, they of course have to be redacted. Juveniles have to be redacted and things like that. And the redaction software was not very user friendly as far as removing faces and, and conversations and things like that. Uh, the watch guard by Motorola was the one we, used, we tested most extensively. And some of the issues we found out, and especially around here, were the wind interference in the microphone. Um, there was times when you couldn't hear any conversations, and that's not going to do us any good. You think the wind blows here? Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we tried different setups with booms and separate mics and buffers, and it just it just wasn't working out very well. And then also the the nighttime resolution and the infrared just didn't work as well as we wanted it to. 
And so that's why um, we looked at the body worn utility system. Uh, in your packet, it had, talks about the numerous, numerous advantages of the system. And it's one of the reasons that uh, uh, Weld County, El Paso County, Colorado Springs Police Department, and here Morgan County have decided to go to the system. And I'm, I'm very pleased that Morgan County is, is following suit because since they have it and we have it, we'll have a resource with them and interchangeable um, interconnectivity and things like that. The biggest thing about the system is they're going to, they, they install a mirror CAD system in the Morgan County Communication Center. And so what it does, and I'm not sure of all the technology, but it basically mirrors the technology that they have in the, in the comm center. And it allows them to do some of the things that's talked about here, um, such as if an officer becomes prone in the field, the um, body worm system starts an automatic recording and alerts all the officers nearby. So that's a plus for us that Morgan County is part of that system as they can be here pretty quick. Um, and it gives the officers GPS coordinates. So it could be anything, you know, there was one time I remember when I slipped on black ice and fell straight down and almost got knocked out. And there I was laying on the ground for a little bit. And so something like that would trigger the system and then someone would be able to help if necessary. That's cool. So, and that's that there's no other system that does that. Uh, detects the uh, firearm being removed from the holster and it also notifies uh, other officers that that's going on. Again, with your connectivity with Morgan County, if Doug or I were to remove our gun from the holster and we aren't able to get on the radio for whatever reason, it's an emergency situation that happens really quick, they'll automatically get a notice at the communication center that we have our gun out and they'll start sending officers our way. Um, it's it's real time. It's it, there's, there's no delay in that. Uh, there is configurations that we can put into the system that other systems don't have and that are including if we turn on our, our light bars it can automatically start the system if we open our door it can automatically start the system and again those are functions that are not available in the other systems the other systems you basically have to remember to hit a button and um, it, i'm sure you've seen some police videos and some of that stuff happens really fast and sometimes you forget and don't have time to push that button. So this system takes about, takes all that out of the picture. It, it automatically does it for us so we don't have to think about it. It also has a geofence. If there's a call, say at um, 310 Becky Street, when we get within a certain geographical area and we can set it, you know, a block, two blocks or whatever, it's gonna set that system to start recording. We get into that geofence area and, and if we pull up and, and something happens really dynamically, really quickly, um, it'll already have started going and, and especially like if a car was to leave the area and we're able to uh, catch up to whatever that geofence would automatically set up uh, the recording, folk, uh, recording system. So as an accelerometer, so if we get into a foot pursuit, it'll, it can tell when we're going from a sedentary uh, situation to something where we're chasing after somebody and it sets you know there's all these fail safe and backup things that allows the system to to record and that's the one thing we want to make sure we're doing we're being transparent and everybody sees everything that we do and we have no problem with that and so this allows us to do that with without even thinking about it um it has a it comes with uh in-car video so it's another thing that the systems don't have you'd have to buy separate packages for those and so the in-car video system is just another thing that we have where the system as it is, is, is built into our, our vest or vest carriers. And it, sometimes it'll be blocked by the dashboard in the car. But we, we overcome that by having an in-car video system that's part of the package also. Uh, oh, and that reminds me, because it's built into our, our vest, there's no way that it can get knocked off. It's integrated into our uniform. And you may or may not have seen, but cameras get knocked off all the time, either in a fight, either, sometimes as simple as taking off your seatbelt could knock a camera off, it catches it just right. So this avoids all that. And this all com also comes with uh, um, evidence gathering capabilities as artificial intelligence that helps us to uh, catalog evidence. And in addition to that, it's the... Um, um, 
it's a, it has a backup system with a license plate reader, an automatic license plate reader that I had mentioned a couple of weeks ago regarding the incident that occurred on Ridge. Having that license plate reader allows us to drive around and it picks up vehicles and it runs license plates automatically for us in a, in a system. And it tells us if a vehicle is wanted, it tells us if a person in the vehicle is wanted and things like that. And so that system is built into it also. So it comes with all the bells and whistles and that's, that's the best part about it. You don't have to buy packages separately. It's all integrated and it all comes as part of the package. <clears throat> um, any questions? If I could add that $60,000 price, that $60,000 price tag, I don't think you mentioned is for five years. So we'll have that and then we have to reevaluate the system. Okay. I so saw that. Yeah. I'm sorry. So we put, we're using the grant money to do the down payment on the system. So then we're paying like $7,000 a year for the right. remaining years. Right. For five years or four? Five. Five. This year and then through 2026 would be the last year. The total of five. What's that do to our budget for this year? We included the cost of body cams in the budget at, you know, at some level, and then we'll budget it the next few years as well. Okay. If I remember, I think we budgeted $9,000. Was Something it? like that. And then, so this was the $7,000 have to come up would be under the original budget. If I recall correctly. Chief, I'm assuming this. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm assuming this solves the storage issue and the, because they're holding the data, correct? That's correct. Okay. And that's that's one of the hugest issues, the biggest issues with body camera systems is the amount of storage and cost that those entail. And this includes the storage on the cloud and it, and it has the um, artificial AI uh, redaction software where it's super simple to redact um, videos. And that's important. I mean, for me, because I don't have a records clerk to do that and I don't have the time to give them, you know, that for them to do it. And I don't have the time to do it myself. And so when I'm doing it with the, surf, with the software, it'll save me a ton of time. Is it the same price, whether we're a police force of two or 10? Whether we what? If we're a force of two or 10, like, is there a certain number it's, of cameras? Or? It, it goes up per camera okay. per system. Yeah. Okay. And how many cameras is this for? This is for three cameras. Plus, plus there's separate cameras for patrol vehicles as well, correct? Correct. Okay. Are we expecting any like maintenance costs, upkeep, like that's not associated with the money that we're putting down? Or it's all included. Forecast, that's all included. That's the best part about this. It's all inclusive. That's huge. Or the other, other systems, they tend to nickel and dime you and then they add things on and yeah. Yeah. And they have in, in the contract that you don't have, they have, um, you know, 24 hour turnaround. I mean, they, they promise uh, pretty good, some pretty good promises that the other departments have said so far so good. Cool. <clears throat> and this is going to be a state law. Yep. It's, it's already signed and ready yeah. to go. Trustee Miller, we budgeted roughly $45,000 in the budget for officer equipment this year. When you say integrated uniform, how are you gonna eat? I'm not sure if the picture is in there, but but we have- um, like This one right here? Uh, no, that one's not, that one wouldn't be integrated. So okay. basically what they do is we have the, the best carriers, they tailor, this is a part of the package thing. Okay they tailor that carrier to put the system inside the carrier. And so all you would see is like a little buttonhole and that's where the camera is. Okay. I thought the picture was in there. I may not have included it. It looks like one uh, kind of like it's uh, already in the, the side of the uniform. Is that the one you're talking about? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. I, so that makes sense as far as you're talking about, as far as taking a seatbelt off, it, it looks pretty flush with the with the chest area so you wouldn't have that issue that that looks really nice correct very uh covert as well i just have one question chief um as far as like uh tech support are they gonna have like unlimited tech support for you guys correct yes okay and then um as far as warranty like if so somehow they get damaged or anything are they gonna um get, get a replacement to you pretty quickly or how's that yes. work Yes, they will overnight a replacement, and that's through the entire uh, five years of the contract. 
Overnight. Okay, copy. Thank you. Is this going to be out of date in two years? <laughs> <laughs> they claim it's not. I mean, it, the way it looks these days, you know how technology is? <laughs> you <Yeah>. never know. <laughs> yeah, I, I do know. <laughs> But they they guarantee that they're gonna they would do all upgrades and everything that that would keep us on great on task for the next five years. Well, it sounds like you've done your homework. Yeah, I was really impressed with the system. Um, I I was actually kind of surprised that Morgan County get what, went with it because of the cost and the fact that they are are doing it. It shows that they, they really trust the system, and that's based on their conversations also with with Weld County, Jefferson County, El Paso County. And these others. are in stock. Yes. Any more? That's a valid question, Bruce. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> no supply chain. Issues. They are ready to go. Okay. Chief, is this one of the ones that you? Now I apologize. I was paying attention, but apparently not good enough. You tried a couple of these systems. Is this one that you tried? No, we haven't tried it personally. So we're we're going kind of off of Morgan County's word. I like the fact that it's integrated, like you said. That's yeah. really where, yeah. where the county's going that way. Yeah. It just kind of makes more sense. Definitely. Did you have conversation with any other departments that have it? Or any yeah, other? everybody's had everything had nothing but good things to say about it. Okay. So. So this is something that we need to put on the next meeting? Yes. <clears throat> if you're okay with it. I am, but I don't know about Chad. <laughs> why, why is everybody... <laughs> <laughs> Chad, I don't get to pick on you. Next <laughs> So it's I, I, I mean I'll, 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 all, all kidding aside it, it seems it seems it seems good I the the one thing I would point out too to people that don't want to spend the money is now I'll be careful with this because it can go both ways but this this kind of stuff can potentially get the town out of some situations particularly legally um, you know when there's there's a claim of of misuse or, uh, you know, abuse of force or all the things that we see it's all too common. Um, we've seen, and I've heard and read more often than not, I think chief could confirm this, that more often than not, it gets the town out of trouble rather than into trouble. Absolutely. And that, that case was just a week ago or two weeks ago with that young lady who was telling them, telling the media that Jeff the officer Pell, yeah. was trying to pick her up and things like that. And then the camera showed exactly what happened and it wasn't her story that was true and that's why we want to go to these sooner as opposed to later we're not going to wait till july 2023 sure as soon as we're ready to the grants ready to go we just need to pull the trigger so to say and we would have these uh, morgan county has their process ready to go and so they're sort of wanting to combine us so we could have it as early as next month That was my next question. How soon will we get them if we okayed it? Yeah, the company was like, hey, it'd be really cool if you could get along, with, you know, get on the same track as uh, Morgan County, and that way we can kill two birds with one stone and take care of it. Okay. I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. Me too. Necessity. Yeah, do it. Yeah. It's great. Okay. okay. Well, Bring a resolution and bring the and get the contract ready to go for the next meeting. Okay. Thanks, Chief, for Thank all the you. homework you've done. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, item two: discussion on vacating streets and alleys or portions thereof. Great. I just want to have a general discussion with the board to kind of get your read on what you guys think about that. We've got at least a couple of situations that we've been approached and it, and staff agrees that it'd be good to vacate streets and alleys in a couple of situations where we don't have any utilities or from a safety standpoint, um, we really don't use the street right away or need the street right away. 
So I just wanted to have a general discussion before I get specific because I've got a, one at least coming up soon that that I'm thinking about. But before I hit with that, I just wanted to have a general discussion and see what you guys were thinking. So would that be something that you would completely, the street would be completely shut off then? Yes. And then, well, or a portion of it, it might not be the whole street. Right. But would that go to the property owner then on each side or? Yes. And that would raise our taxes or raise well, their taxes. <laughs> correct. Raise our revenue, whatever little increment it might right. be. But yes, it would become the property would go back on the tax rolls. But then you get to take control of it. Yes. And we wouldn't be doing it in any cases where it wasn't welcome or it wasn't a joint effort. We're just not going to vacate a street or an alley just because we'll need to have someone that's interested in it and actually working with us to make it happen. And the process necessary to do that includes what exactly? Don't um, I think it be, can be as simple as a request being made to the town or the town making the request to the board. We need to modify the plat for that area of town, uh, get a survey done, and then bring it to it's the board of trustees that needs to approve that. Okay. And it does need yeah. to be done by ordinance. Right. So, yeah. And sometimes it doesn't necessarily need a, a full blown survey, you know, if we're able to describe it with enough particularity, right. um, you know, if you can say the alley between third and fourth street, you know, um, it may not be necessary to do a full blown survey. So, is there anything around me? <laughs> <laughs> I have the same thought. <laughs> huh? I hope so. Uh, not yet, but there could be. I would say it's too early there because of the <laughs> water tank and the uh, booster station upgrades. But, you know, as we get those plans done, maybe there is. All I want is my alley back. <laughs> <laughs> that I never even got. <laughs> I never even got. They didn't even tell me that they were putting up. <laughs> they just took it. That was what I was going to ask you. That's not, that's no lie. Either. Wow. Do we have do we have documentation of all the alleys that we have? I am working with Diamondback Engineering. I think the whole town's right of way system needs to be yes. surveyed and marked yes. because sure. I don't think the maps are accurate from anything we've got. So that's I've asked them to give me a proposal to do that. Okay. So just I mean I know going through Old Town and that there's quite a few that sheds were built where alleys should have been or shops or so you know if we haven't vacated them officially then we should probably get the process started on those that have not been officially vacated as well so yep would the, i agree would the homeowner be responsible for paying for that survey i think it'd be kind of depend on the case by case if it's needed and if it's a benefit to both of us or or to a business owner or, or homeowner. I think rather, I mean, the board could make a policy and say it's got to be paid by whoever is going to get the alley. But right now, I think it can be considered on a case by case basis and part of the negotiation. And that comes straight to the board, doesn't have to go through That's planning right. and zoning first, then to the board. Go straight, comes to, straight the board. to the board. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. Just to for I may bring one to you next meeting. A simple one. Makes sense. But before I went through the, you know, making sure we have everything, I just wanted to get a board's read on it as well. So, and what I'm thinking about is the alley um, behind Stagecoach Meets. It kind of makes sense. We don't have utilities. Um, it can help with his new project. Um, it doesn't leave the uh, property to the south landlocked. So I think it checks the boxes that we need to be concerned with.
even if there is utilities, can we still designate that over to the homeowner and just have a utility easement on it? I think we could have a utility easement. The one downside to a business or homeowners, they would not be able to build over top that alley. And in some cases that might be what they want to do, but we could work to have an easement. And a lot of towns like where I live, the utility easement is eight feet in my backyard. So, and I know that at some point they might have to come through and tear up any small shrubs I've got back there, but it's mine to use uh, until that time. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Move down to other items updates, which include lessons learned from recent events and feral cats for the Northern Colorado Friends of Ferals. Okay, great. I think I'm going to let, well, I'll introduce it. Mark and I have been talking about this based on the recent fire we mm -hmm. had, but there's a couple of events like the windstorm that we had a few weeks ago that uh, opened up, you know, some th thinking between Bo and I, at least on like making sure, you know, the emergency generator is up and running. I mean, we didn't lose anything, but um, it's now going to be checked more frequently because the batteries were dead. So, it, you know, every time we have an incident, we learn something or rather it be something we need to do differently. Or in the case of an exercise I had on a emergency situation dealing with water in Wiggins, we were actually pretty prepared and did a good job on this tabletop exercise. Um, the chief periodically goes through a tabletop exercise on situations. So it's always good to look back and say, okay, how can we be better prepared? Um, on the recent fire, I think Mark discovered some things weren't quite done correctly outside of Wiggins. It's not that the town didn't do things right because we weren't involved, but there were things that may or may not have happened that makes us think about, okay, how can we be better prepared or react to things? Uh, one example, um, Trustee Strickland brought up to me is like, at what level do we need to be worried about the level of water in the water tank? Um, and do we need to have a policy that says at X feet? That's been, we, in, that's been for years. Yeah. For years. I mean, we, and I don't know if it was at 16 feet or whatever, then the yellow flag went up. Right. So I think it's, you know, making those policy, putting those in place in a document, you know, we do have, and I've seen copy, I didn't have a chance to look for it this, this afternoon, but there's a countywide emergency action plan. Uh, between the chief and I, depending on the situation, one of us may be an incident commander if it's uh, in the town. So that you have one, one chief, so to speak, um, giving direction to, to everyone. So I think it's, you know, the chief and I've talked about maybe re-looking at some of that stuff um, through the next year. He's got a friend that goes through some of those uh, trainings and um, wanting to look at what else do we need to put in place policy-wise. And with that, I will let Trustee Tr Strickland chime in your wise words. Sure. So I'll start back with the uh, um, information from the uh, Morgan County uh, Emergency Management website. So uh, if you go to their website, they actually have the uh, um, plan uh, in a link that you can link to. Unfortunately, it's dated 2013. So it's a little outdated. You know, it says the population of Wiggins was around 471, if I remember correctly. Um, <clears throat> what happened was is when we had this fire, uh, I believe it was on Sunday. It was over by uh, Empire Reservoir. There was multiple fires at the same time. There was one um, towards Fort Morgan, I believe, off of 12 uh, to 14, somewhere in that county road area. 
Um, so having two fires plus a, a multi-vehicle accident on Highway 34 going on all the exact same time. So multiple resources from uh, Brush, uh, Fort Morgan, and, and Wiggins were responding to fires and resources from Wiggins, uh, I think South Platte, and uh, maybe even um, Kersey were responding to the fires and the accident over on 34. So I'm listening to dispatch radio and monitoring the weather, um, watching sensors in the area, trying to figure out exactly what's going on. What are they fighting? What are they battling? What are they dealing with? Um, and as it got worse, you know, the winds were probably 50 to 65 miles per hour coming directly from that location to the town of Wiggins. And my concern was, you know, if we have an ember, which embers are the most dangerous part of a fire, they can go miles out in front of the fire, start another fire, and then what resources are left? Very little. So as this is all occurring, um, the, uh, the fire chief or the, uh, the incident commander uh, for Empire, um, it was Empire Command is what it was called at the time, uh, requested for evacuation orders be sent out for I-76 to Highway 34, 144 West at a county line. Now, what had happened was over here in Weld County, where it started, is where dispatch was being communicated to. Over on our side, we have Morgan County dispatch talking to our people split between two incidences. And when the order was requested by command, command assumed that the, the dispatch was gonna be calling emergency management to notify them to send out that reverse 911 code red dispatch assumed that command was going to be making that call to call the emergency management neither of them made that call and no code red or any evacuation orders were actually sent out so once everything concluded um you know command said okay let's go ahead and lift the orders dispatch said we didn't issue any did you issue any they said, no, we didn't issue any. Okay, that really upset me and it just ate under my skin all night until the next day. So the next day, Monday morning, I decided to call everybody and anybody I could think of that was in either involved in this, should have been involved in this, or why weren't they involved in this? And uh, it was interesting. Uh, the response I got was, um, dispatch is not in charge of uh, reverse 911 calls for code red. That is actually supposed to be on the backs of emergency management. Emergency management was never notified and neither was Weld County's emergency management. So they never even knew about it. They knew there was a fire, but they didn't know anything about the evacuation calls. So I said, you guys failed and you really put the town at risk and that really worries me. So whatever SOP you guys need to fix, fix it now. You know, I'm not blaming any particular individual but obviously, whatever SOPs you guys are practicing completely failed, and that scares me. So please do whatever it takes to go ahead and get this taken care of immediately. And they said they've already got it planned for a meeting, I believe, on next Monday. Um, and like I said with uh, Tom Aker, we were talking about, you know, what at what point can, uh, can we possibly have a way to um, implement that? And I think the question is, is... Um, you know, why do we only have a single point of contact if, you know, that person's on vacation, sick, the phone's not working, whatever. So is it possible? My question was, is it possible that the code red or emergency management position could be a floating position, you know, whether that, that could be to the, the fire chief or the police chief or the town manager or the sheriff's department, um, the dispatch center? You know, so if that position could be floating throughout the county, then we hopefully this never ever happens again in any type of uh, you know situation, whether it's weather, um, biological, you know, whatever that could be, um, that that particular message would need to be sent out. Um, so hopefully they can come up with new plans to be able to mitigate those issues. Um, and then going back on the uh, on the wind issue last week with with uh, along with the water water tank. Um, you know, I, I did notice that the water pressure did go down a little bit because of the power outage, uh, but once the backup generator came by, back on, it was fine. Uh, but my point was, is at what point, if we're fighting fires, should we go ahead and uh, try to request something like the code red 
if we go into a, a no water usage because of the tank being at a critical level. Because if currently we have a flag, which who's going to look at the flag when they're at home? Nobody's going to see that flag. Nobody's going to know that flag's even there or, you know, that we're in that sort of condition. So if, if we have a written statement of, of a protocol within the town of Wiggins that states, once we get to that critical level, let's go ahead and try to call emergency management, send out that code red, please, you know, secure all water usage, except in maybe toilets if you can, while this incident is happening so that we can get our reserves back up. That way we don't have any issues with the, you know, cavitating pumps or anything like that, uh, because we want to be able to support whatever uh, firefighting response or, or emergency management completely from our system if we can. That's why we need the 500 gallon tank. And I mean, we've been talking about it for four or five years, maybe six years, and it's nothing, nothing's happened yet. It's got to be done. We got to bite the bullet. And, and I mean, it's been, I know it's been at least, I know it's been at least four years, been four years, if not five or six, been but we four, need backup. It's been four years since it was proposed. It takes 24 hours to fill our tank if it's pretty much empty, right, Bo? With the four inch line going into it. Uh, the, the line that feeds the town tank is a 10 inch line that comes from the RO, and we get 100,000 gallons every three hours. But going into the tank, it's not, tank. but it's not 10 inch going into that tank. It gets reduced down. Well, basically, it's 10 inch coming to town over to Main Street. Reduced down to eight and six. We've got two lines that come in to feed the tank. Yeah, it's six inch feeding the tank, right? Yeah, six, not four. Like I said, basically, we get 100,000 gallons about every four hours. Actually, I get it every three hours, and then I use that next hour to refill the RO tank, and yeah. then it goes back through the same cycle again. So, okay. 500,000 gallon tank. You guys were asking about the level. Uh, basically, when I came on, we were told that any time the town tank gets below 21 feet, we automatically kind of go into our own little alert in the public works system. And during the summer, in the evenings, when everybody is irrigating their lawns, it will drop down to 22, 21 mm -hmm. feet. And that's why we, uh, we're always in favor of the water being shut off at 10 in the morning and then stay off until six because then we can go ahead and take the tank back up to 30 feet at the top of every night. And then even when we're running the RO nonstop, we're pulling more water out of the tank than we can bring in if everybody's irrigating. And we typically will find that the water level in the tank is 25, 24 feet the next morning. And then we just use that data to bring it back up. If there's an unusual event, obviously we can pull more water off. But as an example, in the case that, um, Tom and Mark were talking about when the generator uh, law or when the booster station lost power, um, we were over at the booster station within about a minute and a half of losing power in town uh, because we always like to double check that the generator has fired and it had not. So we had it back up and running within 10 minutes and we had 29 feet of head in the tank, which means that we had roughly 14 pounds of water pressure on the system during that event. And within 10 minutes, we were back up to 60 plus pounds. So I always make sure that before I go home at night that the tank is full. And just uh, so uh, Trustee Strickland knows, we have kind of an informal arrangement with the fire department. I have about five different people on the fire department, starting with uh, Travis is no longer the chief, but Travis was always aware, the assistant chief was aware, uh, some of the firefighters were aware. The minute that there's a fire event, I get a call because I told them what I would like to have happen is anytime you're pulling a bunch of water off of our system, even if everything is working properly, I still want to know so I can monitor what's going on at the RO and at the booster station. And trust me, they've called me at two in the morning or four in the morning when we've had a hay fire or something else. And then we just watch it and we try and find out how many trucks are coming in to pull water off of our system. Because in the, in the last summer, when they had some of the hay fires, we had mutual aid response from Brush and Hill Rose and Fort Morgan. And we would have four or five trucks pulling water off of our system at the same time at different fire hydrants or uh, 
consecutive with one another. And then we just made sure that we brought enough water into town to maintain the tank levels. So uh, I would agree with uh, Trustee Miller that the sooner you get extra water reserve, it's great. But so far in the six years that I've been here, we've not had a circumstance where the tank level was too low unless a sensor failed and the RO just didn't bring water to town, but that was not during a fire, that was not during an emergency event, and the tank level came down. And then that morning it was caught, but the sensors didn't call us. Well, now, we're, <coughs> again, anytime that anything goes wrong at the RO, I get a call on both my town phone and my personal phone. And then uh, Officer Erickson was getting calls last summer when we were having blips, and I've taken subsequently taken him off, and I've got it going to another part-time person's phone right now. But after that, we need to get a few more people on the list. Yeah. Is that yeah. something that the town gets paid for? We have talked about this before. Yeah, I need, with the new chief and the new board, we need to have that discussion. If we get reimbursed for water they pull off, especially if it's water that's outside of the water district, I think they get reimbursed for their services, and I don't see why we couldn't start making the request. To be well, I mean, an insurance company, hopefully they have insurance, but an insurance company will pay for that. Right. And they should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have had an instance, this was about nine years ago, major line break over here. We worked till about three o'clock in the morning finally got it repaired the ro didn't kick on right. and when we went over and checked the tank we were down to six feet right. and it was on a july evening everybody was watering so we had a it was a major issue it took that time that time it took 24 hours to get yeah. everything so if we would have had a major event then it had been catastrophic well, so. and again remember that the existing town water tank is 30 feet tall and every foot of water in that tank is 17,000 gallons so basically, if we're putting in 100,000 gallons every three hours, we're more or less filling up close to a little over five feet in, in three yeah. hours. And if everybody's watering a hot July night or whatever. Like, like you said, if all of a sudden the demand is also taking away while we're trying to fill, that differential changes. Yeah. Bill, your volume dropped just a little bit. Did you say the tank was 30 feet? Yeah. We, uh, yeah. That night when the uh, electricity went out, the tank was at 29 feet. What's, what's the max? We can actually get to about 31 and a half feet before we start puking water onto the softball field. <laughs> <laughs> That's never happened. No, never happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> and talking about the second tank, we're working with USDA trying to pull that out as a separate project so we can get it going now. It's also one of the three projects I submitted to Senator Hickenlooper's office for funding last week through the congressional directed spending request. Well, if, if we would get that, I would feel a lot more comfortable. So would I. <laughs> Me too. And, yeah. and one thing that I'm sure most of you are aware of, when you elevate that tank, the proposals I think are at 140 feet. For every 27 inches of water column, you get a pound of pressure. So if we're 140 feet up in the air, we'll get somewhere between 60 and 65 pounds of pressure at all times, mm -hmm. as long as that tank is full. And that means we don't have to operate the booster station pumps, hmm. which yeah. will be a savings to you every month of the electrical bill for the booster station. Yeah. I think it'd be a good idea in the time being that we set up our own little emergency management plan that if we do get our tank to a certain level, we're going to have to notify the fire department. We're at critical level, so. Right, Bo and the chief and I have talked about that, and we are implementing a system called Polymorphic. I think I mentioned it during budget time, and it's got a program in there where we can, based on the emails that we've got for water customers, we can select different areas or send out a message if we need to. So it's our own code red, so to speak. And just for the, the council's information, in the last couple of years when we have had issues with mechanical equipment, either at the booster station or at the RO, we are in, 
I would say daily communication with the fire department and the school district both so that they know that, hey, we happen to have a pump that's being maintained. If you have any uh, things go on, it's imperative that you get a hold of us. And we have really great communication between the facilities folks at the school and several people on the fire department. So uh, we've really got a, a good communication chain going back and forth between everybody uh, that's involved in stuff that will impact the larger water users. Is there one hydrant that they bill from? I mean, if it was just our district. Um, we typically have been filling off of the hydrant on North Main and Central, unless there's other mitigating issues like the project that's currently going on on the highway. Now they're filling off the hydrant by the bank. Uh, Tom has uh, asked us, we're going to go ahead and get the... But that's the, got a meter on it. Right. We, we make sure that they've got every time that they do bulk water, they've got a meter and a backup right. preventer. That but we, that, during the fire, we haven't had a meter on it. On, on, the, on the hydrants? No, we do not. No. That's why I was asking if there was one. If, and I know that's, that's time to go and throw that meter on there. But. Well, and it's all situational specific because, you know, sometimes they may just go straight back to the fire station because they've got pre pretty big valving over there. They've also got hydrant outside as well, so they can do trucks inside if it's bad weather, outside if it's good weather. And then, of course, if it's somewhere outside of the county, they may even go to Stubbs. There's one right there. Um, so it really depends on the situation. And, and one of the things that needs to be mentioned, if it does go through a meter and a backflow preventer, it drops the pressure inherent to the valves that are there, and it does slow down their fill times. So there is some resistance that's justified by the fire department in terms of doing it that way. Yeah, because we want to help the fire department be able to get as much water right, as possible. Right. And, and if yeah, we get to sword. yeah, if we get to that point of seeking reimbursement, we can talk to the fire district and say, "How many trucks and what size did you fill?" and get the estimate that way. But I mean, water is worth more than gold. I'm sorry, it is. Yep. This also brings up a point of an interconnect with quality water in case of an emergency like that and i'm getting preparing the info on the bed specs okay and i've got to hear back from trent on if his guys can do it or if we're going to need to bid that out as well i think the mayor has a good point because that was i, I know that you haven't had an issue with that tank run into the ground yet but we keep having more roofs popping up mm -hmm. and i i worry that you know to uh, Trustee Strickland's point, if, if that, that fire could have been way worse, and if we have embers chasing, we got another situation like we've seen with the Marshall fire. And uh, my, I guess my question is, is if that tank went dry, can we do what they did in Superior, and can you turn or bypass RO to at least get water up here? Or how does that work, or is that never an option, or... No, the way the system is set up that you can bypass the RO and pump water directly to town. We also have a hydrant at the RO where they can take water directly off the well pumps. We can bypass the RO skids and they can take it right off the hydrant there. So if there's an, a time when we just need to give them lots of water and leave our water alone, and it would have made sense to, as an example, fill up at the RO hydrant mm -hmm. during the Empire fire. Yeah. Excellent. That makes sense. Because, and then that, that's why that your comment about the interconnect got me to thinking about that. That would be a great alternative as well. If we ran dry, you just pull from there if you have yeah. to. Obviously, you're not going to bypass RO unless it's a complete catastrophe. But <laughs> well, again, the, if all we're doing is using water as an example for bulk water purchases or for firefighting, we prefer in the ideal situation, we prefer not to chlorinate and not to reverse osmos. Yeah. Sure. That system is so expensive. To have. Sure. Because all they want is something to put the fire out or something mm -hmm. to keep the dust down in the case of the bulk water use. And uh, I'm sure at some point, Tom will let you know, we're working on a, a program where we can have our bulk water users use non-potable water and not take off the system. Can we get it out of our, our that's our plan. <laughs> yeah, our, our pump station out here on. That's our plan. Well, it kind of repeat. I should have known, Tom. I'm ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've already had discussions among the three of us to make sure that the traffic logi uh, logistics work out and that metering logistics work out. But it's just a much better way for the town to utilize the old wells. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I'm talking to the water attorneys to make sure I don't do anything that gets us in trouble. And we can't use that water outside of Kiowa Bijou District, but most of it's used in town. So we can utilize that water. And don't we have to use that in order to yes. keep those wells active? Yeah, yes. We're supposed to be using it. them as little as a couple of days a year, but we have yeah. to use them so we don't lose the water. Right. right. Yeah, we got to use them. When was the last time that pump station was run? Uh, summer, tail end of summer. So it did get run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, uh, we provide monthly water reports to the, our water engineering firm. And <clears throat> one of the things that we have to do all summer long is report on augmentation and how much water we run into the ditches yeah. and into the aug ponds and how much water we pump out of the wells on a monthly basis so that they can file those reports with the state. On the on the Kiowa yeah. Bijou, right? Yeah. No, I'm talking about the water that comes out of the old wells because we've always in the last couple of years we've used that for water. Some of the trees around the retention ponds and some of the trees in the right. back. But, yeah. Because if you don't use it, you lose ten percent yep. a year. Yep. And then you and I, I talked to Mo the night we lost power, and him and I discussed. My did talk to Tom about it. Did you look into? Or talk to Tom about any type of battery minders or something yeah, for. Had, um, there was a charger there at the station, and that's a 24 volt system. The one battery was fine. The other one that had the charger on it was dead. <laughs> so the, the delay in getting it started is I pulled my truck up to the front of the, the building, and it wasn't quite enough. So we had another public works person there within about three minutes after I first got there, and then that's. We just basically jumped the generator and got her running. So we're uh, in the process of uh, getting the new battery in tomorrow. And then we are putting the kind of chargers that float. So it'll bring the battery up to voltage and amperage, check it periodically. It'll drop it off so it doesn't overcharge it because the battery that's in there that's dead had been overcharged. Okay. Good. Oh, so it was uh, just a trickle charger versus a smart charger? Yeah, and, the, and it, basically it's a smart trickle charger, so it'll go ahead and drop the signal out or the charge out when it doesn't need to. And the uh, uh, other thing I was going to mention is that um, we, after this uh, last go around, the quote unquote topic of the agenda is lesson learned. We have always fired all of the generators on, at all the facilities at least once a month, and some of them start every week anyway, but we're going to start doing it once a week. And we're also going to load test all the batteries once a week. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. You might get a corporate time that. job. Boy. Yeah, we're going to. <laughs> yeah. we're going to corporate that. That'll be incorporated into the rounds. Okay. Well, I got one more question for you. Um, I think in the past I've, I've asked about the um, uh, load on the water system coming from the irrigation for the fields. And I thought you mentioned at one point that it was around 50%, that 50% of the uh, irrigation or 50% uh, of the tank uh, water was going to the water on the, on the grass. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, basically the, to give you an example, uh, this time of year, we're bringing roughly a hundred thousand gallons of water to town every day. That's our, our load. And so basically we can run the pumps from the RO to the booster station for three hours and then an hour to refill the RO tank so that we're ready for the next day. Um, because of the bulk water usage recently, that has gone up to twice what it is. So we're running the RO currently six hours a day and using two hours to fill up the RO tank so we're ready for the next cycle. And it's all done typically automatically. Um, when we go to summertime usage and we basically have all the homeowners doing their irrigation, we're going through five or 600,000 gallons a day, sometimes more. Basically the last two summers, as the Kiowa Park development has built out, we, the RO is typically running 23, 24 hours a day. And then obviously it's, it's doing its backwash cycles in that 23 and 24 hours, but we're continually pumping water to town. And then we lose ground during the evening into the morning of we're using more water going out of town than we are actually bringing in from the RO. And that's why we've got the 10 o'clock shut off in the morning to six o'clock. So um, what, uh, Tom had been talking to you about and I'd suggested was finding a way to take the two biggest water users for irrigation, which are the town and the school off of that system. And Tom's in the process of de developing a program for that too. Getting some purple pipe. 
It might be lavender, but it's close. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Depends how long it's set in the sun. <laughs> and we're also changing in its past overdue. We're changing the filter media out at the RO as well. We've got that ordered. Um, we are able to find a like spec filter media that's about $150,000 less expensive than the original. Wow. We had to go through the state to get permissions yeah, to be able to. wants to give us the approval for that, but yeah. it was worth the wait. Yeah. Yeah. Do we want to see the old filters at this point? No. We're probably not. <laughs> it's actually the media that moves in, in the, the filters. filters. Yeah. Still. Yeah. Hey, any other questions? No, thank you. No, thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. So, more to come on this between the chief, Bo, and myself. So, we'll be, um, when we have free time, uh, developing these plans. So, uh, uh, Tom, does that does that plan for sure that we're going to try to get some uh, some purple pipe from those wells down to irrigate the fields so that we can take those off the line? That's what my that's what my goal is before summer. Okay. We want to plan it to make it large enough that if we could in the future incorporate a non-potable system throughout town. I know it adds more expense, but up front, but in the long run. I think we can do that. I'm not totally through all the gyrations of figuring it out, but it makes sense. Yeah. While we're doing it to do it the right way the first time and plan for the future. That's yeah. something that Bo and I often talk about anything that we're doing. Yeah. So basically that, that purple pipe, wouldn't have to be that deep, would it? Because no, it wouldn't get drained in the winter time, right? Because you wouldn't need it. And if I can get the right permissions and make sure we're doing everything, you know, per the water courts and all our decrees, we would start out this year just laying it on top of the ground and then bury it as we get time. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Mark, I appreciate you running uh, that situation up the flagpole and raising heck because uh, the first I heard of it was when you notified me. So ah. uh, I would have burned up. So thank you. <laughs> you got it. Yeah, I had other neighbors texting me, hey, what do you smell smoke? What's going on? And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a fire and we're packing our bags right now. I actually found out because it made the Denver news. Yeah, it was on the Fox 31 news app. So, <laughs> through a friend who was driving uh -huh. back from Nebraska, said I can't get back to Greeley because the floor is closed. I'm like, what are you talking about? Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Oh, and then Bo, thank you to your team too uh, for getting that uh, yep. RO back up so quick. I appreciate that. I know that keeping that is not an easy chore. So, thank you. Especially when you're battling 60 mile an hour wind. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that probably wasn't yeah. fun. Tom, that brings up one other question. Um, we did get one of the impellers replaced at the booster station. Did we get the other one replaced? Not yet. We haven't yet, but we don't think it's as – we're not having the issues with that pump that we're having with the other pump. Is that something that we should think about getting as a replacement part on hand? That and having, we've got the other pump. We just need to figure out it. We need to get it wired in. I mean, as far as the impeller, that, that motor comes with the impeller. It would not be a bad idea. Okay. We are slowly between Bo and I getting backup parts that, we have the town has long not had the backup equipment in park. So little by little, we're getting the backup pieces of equipment that we need to have and having it at the right place. Okay. Thank you. And one last thing on emergency. 
we still use our our sirens for tornado, correct? That's FEMA that turns on, yes. Okay, so that brings up uh, another point. People at Kiowa Park can't hear that. It's my understanding the fire department quit using that years ago. Yeah, I think it's just strictly for emergency. But, but we weren't thinking and planning ahead because you can't hear it from out there. I know for a fact you can't. So if we have a fire, we have a tornado warning when they're blowing that siren. We should be, because I, I can hear the train. <laughs> yeah, they said they can't hear them. It was when that tornado hit last year and they went off. They said they couldn't. Talk to a couple of residents said they could not hear that while being inside the house. So I it might be something that we just think about in the future to reload, to add another siren on the south end of town here. They used to. Tell yeah. You all about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had two young kids that would go to sleep around noon and then wake back up, and make my wife really unhappy. <laughs> we'll get into that. But yeah. I know most cities have moved away from outdoor warning systems. They've, they've found them to be, like yeah, like they found them to be vulnerable to attack for hardware, for uh, hackers. Hackers, thank you. Yeah. So. I know Fort Morgan's got theirs. They play theirs on Friday at noon. I don't disagree with you, Mayor. I think I think I think it's something we should have. But yeah, I know yeah. Brush does it in Akron, just out here mainly. But right, small. We'll, start, we'll look into that. Yeah, see if there's a grant or something. Right, that'd be good. Okay, that's all I got. We move down to feral cats. Okay, we got a few of them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the uh, northern front range friends of feral cats. It's a mouthful. Um, they were out uh, first part of April and actually the last part last weekend of March. And they this uh, foray, they got um, 120 cats between the March and the April, including 101 kittens. In a, what? Well, wait a minute. Make sure I said from a colony. There are 71 kittens. Um, so it's been successful from their end. Um, they've uh, had 85 cats in February, and they've been out a, another time. But in all total, they've done, they've taken care of about 200, almost 300 cats getting them spayed and neutered in town. And reason I wanted to bring it up, one is report back, let you know what they're what they were doing. But I'd also like to give them a donation out of our donation account. They had a couple of citizens that have donated at least fifteen hundred dollars, if not more. Um, their expensive expenses have been about. Um, nine thousand dollars in all these events between surgeries and <laughs> vet bills and um they had to actually put some down so what i'd like to do is at least give them a thousand dollars to start and maybe look at giving them another thousand dollars to match what the citizens have donated for because they <laughs> are providing a good service in town that we wouldn't have the capability of doing otherwise. Um, so just wanted to run that by the board before I would do something. I think it's great. What That's is the law idea. on cats? If I got a cat coming over and I don't know where he's <laughs> coming from, you want to pass a and, and he goes and jumps on my new pickup, and he <laughs> He's going to get lead poisoned. <laughs> I mean, that's the bottom line. And people are going to be crying. <laughs> there, and the chief can correct me. But one, please don't do that. Um, hey, it's going to happen. I just painted a truck. And the first time I see claw marks going up it, 
I might not shoot him, but he's not. <laughs> He's not going to leave the yard. Go. Never, never, never. <laughs> I don't. I don't care. That's the bottom line. It costs um, twenty five hundred dollars to paint a pickup, and somebody can't keep their cat at home. Cats are problem. Cats are like dogs. They're supposed to be kept either on a leash or inside. They're not supposed to. <laughs> on a leash. <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> actually, we had, my, my <laughs> wife and I had a cat when we first got married, and we lived in an apartment, but he liked to go outside, so we trained him on a leash, and he would go for walks. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's the best practices for cats is not to let them go outdoors or they're, they're fair game for coyotes and dogs and, and diseases. People so, don't care. Right. People don't care. So I, I don't have the answer. Trustee Miller. I do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I wasn't, I wasn't looking for answers. I'm just, I'm just state facts. Yes. <laughs> Bo, you better put Dozier on a leash. All right, so if folks are in agreement, I'll work with them and we'll yeah. give them a donation check. They would appreciate any help. They've, they've just mentioned they'd like help if we can do it, and I think it's been a worthwhile effort, and I'd like them to come back to Wiggins. They need to. Okay. That's all I had. I know we've got a lot of work ahead of us, so. Okay, future agenda topics. The only thing I wanted to ask, did we, was brought up before the work session, I think December, November, about maybe possibly trying to advertise our business district? The, How's that come? The Wiggins Business Alliance is putting together a, a for lack of a better term, a flyer or a booklet about the businesses in town. So I'm letting them take that lead because they're trying to get more activity and get membership. So um, we'll, we will, like in the past, start get listing businesses that have business licenses on the website. And then I did have a suggestion the other day from a gentleman, you know, finding out and seeing a way we could list, like, where can you recycle paint or who are you know, make sure the list is up to date on who does do electrical in town and who does plumbing without endorsing them, just yeah. making sure that is known. But I think the Wiggins Business Alliance, and I didn't go to the, they had an after hours on Tuesday. I wasn't able to make that, but I'll check in with Mandy and with folks to see where that's at. Because I listen to a, <clears throat> I listen to a developing development podcast, mainly for commercial. Um, they say you know, like if you do have a commercial district that's starting out, kind of like we've got with Stubbs, to there's like through the CML stuff like that, you can advertise for businesses looking for a location to move to. So, um, didn't know if we could do something like that for our commercial development is coming in not really throwing a red arrow out at Wiggins but yet how many people do know that we have an area for them if they'd like to move to a different talk location with Kristen with economic development as well how to get that out I have been at there's a international shopping center convention in Vegas every year where towns and developers will go together to advertise that they've got a development ready to go. Um, I don't think Roberts 81 is quite at that point, yeah. but it'd be great at some point if they have 
or develop that plan, or let's say the Roberts develop their commercial area and get it lotted out and planned for what they would like, then there are areas where you can advertise that and say, we've got a corner spot that's ready. And it, one of the key things, it's got to be ready to be built on. It's got to have the infrastructure in and things of that nature so that if a Walgreens or something decided to come in, they don't want to put the infrastructure in. They want to just build a building up from the ground. So it's working at the right time with the developers to make that type of advertisement. Well, I think with what's coming, you're going to start to see if they talk to you about when they're ready to put the infrastructure in there with what they've got coming now. I've been hearing off and on. I do have a meeting Thursday with them tomorrow. And, you know, they want to look at subdividing one of the tracks. And I, that's one of the discussions I want to have with them is when are they going to put that main pipeline in? It's been something I've been encouraging them to do since I got here yeah. is to get some of the infrastructure in place to where people can see that, oh, it's ready to ready go. To go. <clears throat> yeah. And they're ready to connect onto our water, right? They've already um, stubbed out on central with the drives that they put in. So it's just a matter of them putting in the rest of the infrastructure. Good. And what about, because isn't it in the deal that stubs will connect to our water as well, correct? Yes. And how's that going with that? I haven't been making that an issue just because we need to get the other tank up. That's true. Yeah. (laughs) Be a little bit more water use. Yeah. But they're well aware of it. Okay. In South Central or uh, Morgan County quality water. So. Yeah. Uh, just for a future agenda item, just for maybe even just more of a curiosity, the rate study. Where are we at in terms of having continued? I had a discussion with Chris and with USDA last week. I'm getting comments back from Chris. I actually have the rate study. It's not, in my mind, it's got a little bit, some small tweaks need to be made before I'm ready to pass it out to you guys. And I've talked to Chris about scheduling it such that he can come and make a presentation. We're trying to make everything, USDA's interest is trying to make our projects affordable from USDA standpoint and the town standpoint. So we're, there's a few more questions I want to ask before we release it. Because that could impact obviously the numbers. Yes. Some of what you just did, some of the meeting we just had might impact our numbers. Right. Uh, So, all right. I was just curious. It's been what four or five months since we yeah. had that one meeting. Yeah, and I've had lots of phone calls saying two hundred dollar a month water bill, and I'm like, no, just hold hang on. on. Yeah, hang on. Don't don't, don't flip but out yet. The money from the water bill that doesn't go to projects, does it? Right or now, the have to. Right now, the way our budget is situated, we use the tap fees a lot more than we should for operational (coughs) in the future tap fees and it should have been done long time ago should be used just for capital projects and your rates the rate charges should be used for the operational like bow and like replacement of parts and pumps and things of that nature and we'll get there I guess one last thing I got is, well, two things. <clears throat> so on the November ballot, are we still going to try to have home rule and a sales tax increase? Or are we going to? Well, the one meeting you missed, I think the board, and we can revisit it, said, let's hold off on home rule one time, my time. Um, but also, it wouldn't necessarily allow folks to 
um, that live outside of town to vote or businesses owners to vote. And I think that was one, um, what I heard one thing that some of the board was wanting. Um, and I actually heard from a couple of business owners, but I did tell them a good way to get involved is once we became home rule that they could get involved from a planning and zoning standpoint and getting the Wiggins Business Alliance more active and we could have a council or a board liaison to that committee. That would be one way to get mm -hmm. their voices heard. And that seemed to resonate with that one business uh, representative. Um, I've thought about the sales tax. I think it'd be good to um, bring that up at the next work session with the complete new board and get their support. And then also um, Deb will likely be bringing, should we hold our elections in November, do a coordinated election with the county to um, do away with some of the extra workload of doing it in uh, April. But that takes a vote of the public as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, just uh, one other comment about the um, home rule. We, as a board mayor, we did think it was a good idea, just not at the time because of the cost that that the town was going to have to put up front to to implement such a thing and and to be able to get. Um, some traction from some, you know, people to actually participate. We felt at the time with the lack of participation in the town currently that we should just maybe wait a little bit. Maybe next year might be a better time for that. Yeah, we do have a lack of participation. What was our total uh, election ballots mailed out? I mailed out 1,059 ballots. We have a total of 308 voted. I, I mean, that's... Well, we I hate to say, but that's pathetic. The vote isn't over yet, but so, we'll have to add one more, but yeah. It's pathetic. Yeah. I know the national average is 30%, but Jiminy Christmas, you live in a town of 13, 1,400 people, and you're too busy to stay. We even made it easy on them. Right. Well, I'm, I'm not all for mail-in ballots. You know, I'm like the, the both being able to deliver and mail. We made it real easy on, if anybody's watching, we made it easy on you. And everybody I've talked to is like, oh, well, I forgot it was coming or, well, I didn't really think I needed to vote or it's kind of disheartening that you. Well, the other thing is that yeah. uh, some of those were inactive. And so there was deceased and there was um, people, especially with the apartments, there's a lot of moving in and out. And if they haven't changed their affiliation here, then we don't know. And so I don't know how many different that should be but there was some of that as well. I mean, at least to get to 50%, you know, but. You know, Tom, so. <clears throat> my thought about that coordinated election is I think you would get higher yeah. participation. Yeah, right. So. Because right. I don't think people, I mean, when I moved here and I found out that we did this in April or whatever, I was like, it, it was bizarre to me. I just got a ballot in the mail one day and I was like, oh. <laughs> so. Who I vote for? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so we'll be bringing that up as well in the future. And it takes a vote of the public to change yeah. that date. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's all I got. That's all I got. Anybody else got anything? Mark, you got anything? I spoke my piece. Okay. Time is 8.20 and uh, work session is hereby adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. You <coughs> oh. say needs time. Yeah. yeah. I see take people guess. Ten minutes. Um, we okay. You have to shut off that meeting. Yeah, you got to shut off yes. that one and we'll... Actually... You don't need to worry about the next. We got to. Well, we got to go live for a bit. Yes, keep it on this one for the start of the work of the special meeting, and then switch. Yeah, because we have to run the special before the exact. Yes. <laughs> That's it. Yeah.
Yep. Oh, so is it still live right now? Should we pause the live feed or can you pause it? Can we pause the live feed? Are we going on break? <laughs> We've already had some to start the meeting. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. You've got Mayor, you've got two more options, two more chances to have a hot mic. <laughs> I think he's waiting for the I think he's waiting for the adjournment for the hot mic at the end. <laughs> How's your new baby? Yeah, sleeping a little bit. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, not much. <laughs> More than my wife, though, so I can't complain. I wouldn't be sitting. Well, it's a good thing that's not hot like me. Uh -huh. Boy or girl? Boy. Three boys, you know. Never gets any easier, though. You finally get to that stage where they're starting to get out of diapers and yeah. a little self sufficient, and then you start all over again. <laughs> so, Are you still, yeah. is your wife still wanting to try for a girl? I don't know. Said, if it was up to her, she'd, she'd probably have four. I think I might be good with three. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> it's still too early to tell. Can't do that sex thing like they do with cattle, huh? Right. <laughs> Here. <laughs> I have to put my coat on. Oh, no worries. No, you keep it. <laughs> What's going on out there anyway? I don't know. <laughs> I better go check. They're just getting a fresh don't uh, and they saw I behave. <laughs> yeah, right. Did you get your boat situation figured out? Not yet. Pretty good. I asked Mark. Busy. Mark said I have a boat. How about you? Cover it, put it yeah, it's so stressful for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's tough for sure. Yeah. Or just not get a boat. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> or get a smaller or get a smaller. Good, good. Well, I'll tell you what. Okay. I don't have a way to pull it in, I think, so I should probably yeah, pick that up. Convenient. I've been trying but that to there's a solution for that. I know, but it's I've got been a bigger vehicle. For three months to buy a truck. Oh, oh my God. I, yeah. yeah. It's unreal. Done with it. Mm. Well, you can build one, but yeah. we can't get there for six months. And then when it gets here, we're going to tack on 5000 just because. <laughs> Look, they're doing this called market adjustment. Yeah. Oh, it's such a scam. Hmm. I thought, okay, well, we could afford Maverick. I can afford that. They'll pull 4,000 pounds. They're like, oh, good luck next year. Okay. We'll get you one. How about something like a ridge line? I looked at that today. I have mixed emotions about it. Um, so I think so so like so Plus, like I said, it's in the garage. Oh, but even those are like 45. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, don't, I just can't believe what they did. You, did they design yeah. that list of? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm not too good. Especially groceries anymore. Gosh, it's not on the start of Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. No. We, wanna, we did Safeway the other day. We never do Safeway, but we did Safeway because Walmart. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I, I don't think we do the online. Right. Mm -hmm. Everything was out of stock. Everything. Do so you said, get your you signature see? discrepancy letters? I think it was 160 bucks and okay. we got there. And it was okay. just yeah. a handful of bags. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I can't see that. I feel bad. Yeah. I was just yeah. sorry for the day that all these right. people. <clears throat> Particularly like where you're at, they're front range in that, that are under contract, that because of the rates, it's sort of changed. Well, you would know this, but by, by the time the really, they hammer starts back. swinging yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and they close, the rate yeah, has right, changed right. so much. That they yeah, you can only do a rate lock for 60 days, 90 days, whatever. Yeah, it is. yeah no, right. It's, yeah, no. How's the supply chain now for a building? Uh, Still bad? 
some things are. I mean, windows are still long lead time garage doors. We're struggling to get those in. Uh, but lumber's coming down a little bit, so that's, okay. that's getting better. It's hasn't been too bad. It's it's mostly just you know, people are still half staff. They're not producing as much as they were. I did hear a report the other day that the shipping container backlog in LA is down to 50 boats yeah, waiting like to load from a, <laughs> yeah, that's a good 45 yeah, or no, yeah. something like that. Right. One of the local yeah. government agencies, yeah. Oh. I'm kind of ready for uh, normal yeah, April right. weather to show up. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. It's gonna go home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're ready. <laughs> We're ready. <laughs> and uh, you would have been started by now. Okay. All right, time is 8.27, Wednesday, April 13th. Town of Wiggins Board of Trustees special meeting is hereby in session. Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Let me get roll call, Deb. Trustee Chad Forbes. Here. Trustee Jerry Schwint. Here. Trustee Brian Flax. Here. Trustee Bruce Miller. Here. Trustee Mark Strickland. Here. Mayor Pro Tem David Herbstman. Here. Mayor Jeff Palmer. Here. Right, thank you. Okay, next item is approval of the agenda as written. I make a motion that we approve the agenda. Second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. Roll call, please. Yeah. Trustee Chad Forbes? Yes. Trustee Jerry Schwent? Yes. Trustee Brian Flax? Yes. Trustee Bruce Miller? Yes. Trustee Mark Strickland? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem David Herbstman? Yes. Mayor Jeff Palmer? Yes. All right, agenda approved. Okay, item two is an executive session for three different items. First one is for discussion of a personnel matter under CRS section 24 6 402, paragraph 4, subsection F, and not involving any specific employees who have requested discussion of the matter in open session. Any member of this body or any elected official, the appointment of any person to fill an office of this body or of an elected official or personnel policies that do not require the discussion of matters personal to particular employees, town manager evaluation. Item two is for the purpose of determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations, developing strategy for negotiations and or instructing negotiators under CRS section 24-6-402-4E, the glassy farm. And item three is for discussion of a personnel matter under CRS section 24-6-402-4F and not involving any specific employees who request a discussion of the matter in open session, any member of this body or any elected official, the appointment of any person to fill an office of this body or of an elected official, or personnel policies that do not require the discussion of matters personal to particular employees, police chief salary. Okay. Do we have to read all that? You can just say so moved. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I'll make a, how about this? I'll make a motion that we go into executive session. I'll second. Okay. Motion been made and seconded. Trustee Chad Forbes? Yes. Trustee Jerry Schwent? Yes. Trustee Brian Flax? Yes. Trustee Bruce Miller? Yes. Trustee Mark Strickland? Yes. 
Mayor Pro Tem David Herbstman. Yes. Mayor Jeff Palmer. Yes. Okay. Mark, did you get the second email? Yes, I did. Is that or he clicked He's, off? He'll be back. Yeah. He might have clicked. He clicked He's off. He's got to come in on the other one. <clears throat> and then it still says live on 